the fascinating and ever-changing world of agriculture. Let's hit the road here in Georgia and meet the farmers, producers, makers, and bakers who keep us all fed and keep us coming back for more. Straight ahead at the Fork in the Road. Georgia farmers, artisans, merchants, and producers, we depend on these men and women every day of our lives through the choices we make and the food we consume. Their strategy and approach is always shifting, but the end game remains the same, results. When we were young, we worried about the sting of a bee, but it rarely happened. More often than not, the honeybee goes about her business, and a fascinating business it is. And when I say she, well, the girls are the only ones putting in the work. And what wonderful work it is. Let's begin our sweet honeybee journey way down south in Homerville, Georgia, home to Ben Bruce and his wide variety of flavors at the Honey Shack. Ben Bruce knows his bees well. He knows where they've been and what they're up to, for the most part. He knows what they're eating and, more importantly, what they like and when. And for the bees down here, the blooms are plentiful. And from that sweet nectar, these bees kindly create their magic elixir. What they're making now is gallberry, but I mean, there's there's probably going to be some Tupelo mixed in with it, and there'll be some palmetto before it's over with, and, and then another bush called Cena bush. My dad started with one hive back in the 80s. Come along and gradually started getting more and more hives, and then we took and expanded and started actually packing up honey. And then from there, we opened up this retail shop in 2014. How many bees do you have? I don't have a clue, a bunch. Probably 30 or 40,000 to each colony. So, you know, you take that into consideration with two or 3,000 hives, so that's a lot of bees. That is a lot of bees. Homerville is home to Bruce's Nut and Honey Farm and the Honey Shack a destination that's just a short drive from downtown and full of local Georgia-grown goodies. Here, they still believe in the honor system. Take your honey and leave your money. With over 2,000 hives to tend, Ben may not be around to greet you all the time, but his family often is, and the honey will be here, including their raw, unfiltered private selection, which was a flavor of Georgia winter. The Georgia honey is real slow on granulation. It's really sought after all over the United States and all over the world. Every flavor is fantastic and also quite nutritious. Most honey contains vitamins A, E, K, B1, B2, B6, and vitamin C, among several other healthy proteins and amino acids. And it's truly fascinating how different each variety can taste. This is something else we make some honey off of, and it's a real dark honey. It's a bay honey. That's a bay tree. Tell me about the different flavors that come from all these. Bays, it's real strong. It's kind of a real bold taste to it, kind of almost like cane syrup tasting. Gallberries, it's, it's real sweet, a real mild honey. And then the palmetto, it's a darker honey, but it's kind of mild too. It's a little more bold than the gallberry, but gallberry's real, real mild though. So do you kind of never know exactly what it's going to be like? like no, like each frame could be like when we're pulling out the frames that you can see the honey. You can actually see the different, like where they start and stop the different honey flows in there. You can see the different colors of the honey and kind of tell what it's going to be. Tell me what we're looking for here. I'm just looking just to see how much they've done since we was in here last. That's like eggs. And then you got the honey that's around it. So the dark is the eggs, the white is the honey, and then they cap it? That's right, then they cap, capped over it. And that's like the comb like we cut to put in the jars. Our cut comb, it's like world famous. It goes all over the United States because of its slow granulation period. I mean, most places make comb honey, but it, it granulates really fast. 
Now is that a queen on top or is that a drone? That's a drone. The queen should be down, further down. And each stack has a queen, right? Oh yeah, each, each, each hive will have a queen in it. See where they're starting to draw this to make this look like that. And they can actually draw like one of these whole boxes out in just a day or two. The bigger brood right there is drone brood. That's like the, the male bees. And then this is all like this, just regular bees, like the female bees, which they're all female except for the drone. So you're, you're going into their hive. Why are they not feeling threatened right now? I reckon they know me. <laughs> we smoked them. I mean, we done what we were supposed to. We'll, we'll let them know we're here, though, for sure. So this is like where they stay at all year. We put these boxes on as they're making honey. This is all like baby bees. And this is what you want to see now because they're getting ready to make honey because all this stuff's fixing to hatch out. And how long after the bees hatch until they start making honey too? Well, they live a 21 day cycle. During, the, during this time of the year, their wings will just fall off of them whenever they're out making honey. So while Ben tends to the 2,000 hives, the female worker bees continue to do what they do best, a fascinating creature that keeps our earth blooming and our palates content. From the swamp honey of Homerville to the mountain apiaries of Lake Mont, Georgia, where one of the world's most knowledgeable beekeepers has teamed up with the University of Georgia in search of a solution. His hives scatter the mountains. His colonies have helped pollinate flowers and crops all around the country, and his methods are studied and shared all over the world. Yes, Bob Benny may be the most interesting beekeeper in the world. Pollination is the main benefit of honeybees in this country. Years ago, I used to travel a lot. I've had bees in as many as nine states. I would start in California and then into Oregon and Washington State, on to the Dakotas, and I've had bees in Wisconsin, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. So. In past years, we did a lot of moving around, but I'm a little older now. I don't, I don't care much for that. Living out of motels and trucks and traveling so much, we just stay close to home. Every bee yard that we have right now, I think there's 38 current bee yards. They're all within 30 miles of this uh, home location. We are what is considered producer packers. In other words, we're beekeepers and we produce honey, but we also pack large amounts. We purchase honey from many other beekeepers that I know and trust, and we have honey in several major chains, Kroger, Walmart, and others. Last year, we packaged about a million and a half pounds in the facility here. Honestly, I'm quite amazed that we do it. It's not a large processing facility, but we push an awful lot of honey through here. Honey doesn't spoil as long as the moisture content is correct. The magic number is about 18% moisture. If it's got more water than that, it will ferment if it hasn't been pasteurized. So in Georgia, as you know, the humidity, we often wake up to 100 or 90% humidity here in this county. So we counteract that by bringing our crop into a room where we can dry it down a little bit before we extract it. This rack that you hear over here is a large commercial dehumidifier. We have it running 24 seven during our extracting season. I don't know if you can feel it. This room is very dry. The humidity in here is very low. And we'll turn these fans on that are in the ceiling and drive that very dry air through our honey supers. We're not trying to make it extremely thick. We just want to pull one or two percentage points of water out before we extract it. We're currently going through about 70, 55 gallon drums of honey per week. And the different types of honey, I guess, sells for different prices. That's right, sourwood is considered a Cadillac honey and goes for probably twice the amount of money of just normal wildflower. Sourwood is kind of a southern Appalachian specialty. You really can't get it in other parts of the world. 
Bob has been at this for decades, and his experience is well documented. This technique's really pretty simple, and what's cool about it is you don't have to find the queen, so a lot of beginner beekeepers might find this attractive. His YouTube channel has tens of thousands of followers and is one of the best sources for someone who wants to get started in this industry as a profession or a hobby. Now that I've found the queen and I put her in the colony, I don't have to shake anymore. I know she's in there. He shares his knowledge, his tricks, and everything else he can do to help both bees and beekeepers. Here in Lakemont, you can tour the shop, see the bees up close and in action, you can try free samples, and even get everything you need to start your own hive. We have a lot of beginners that come in here, a lot of beginning beekeepers. We answer a lot of questions for people, but everything in the store is oriented into honeybees one way or another. Bob Benny's vast beekeeping knowledge was discovered years ago by the University of Georgia Honey Bee Program. And together, they are working to fight a destructive mite that has been ravaging the world's honeybee population for a long time. We are in Bob Benny's bee yard right now. And what we're doing, we're wanting to get real world research. We've worked with Bob Benny a lot in the past, uh, numerous other projects, and he has been so gracious to donate 45 colonies for us to test a new product for Varroa control. Back in the late 1980s, we had a mite that came in to the United States, an ectoparasitic mite. It has never been on Apis mellifera, our Western honeybee. It evolved on Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee. So our Western honeybee has no natural defense whatsoever. They're on the adult bees, and they're also inside of the cat brood. So what we're doing today is we're gonna be testing this product. It's called Alien Cap and it's an oxalic acid extended release material. And what it does, it's gonna capture all of the mites over a 42 day period. And as the bees are emerging from the cells, hopefully they're gonna be come in contact with this product and hopefully we'll get some kind of good control. The lovely part about this particular product, oxalic acid is found naturally in colonies in honey. That's what makes this product really beneficial to especially the commercial beekeepers that they can treat during times where mite loads are high and doing devastating effects on the colony. Having that ability to use it while honey is still on the colonies is huge. Whenever we start up a, a study, we need to know how many bees are in the colony, how much brood, how much honey, and then also how many mites. So we have a beginning point then we will apply the material, and then at the end of the study, we come back and we do the same thing. And we can tell, is this material uh, having negative effects on the bees or on the brood? If we find that it works very good with killing mites, then we will probably hand our data off to USDA and let them look at getting it registered for use in the United States. I think it's exciting. I think it has a great promise, and I'm looking forward to it probably working. It look, everything about it looks good to me. So I'm glad to donate my colonies for this because I think it's really going to be a good thing. From the sweet southern honey of Homerville to the tasty flavors from Blue Ridge Bob, we now head to the city, right downtown, to the rooftop of an iconic Atlanta landmark. From this view, it's easy to see why Atlanta is sometimes called a city in the forest. So much green draped over the winding roads and honking cars, but up here on a rooftop, under the shadow of a famous blue dome, lies a honeybee habitat that is watched over by a couple of chefs that are accomplishing something very special and for a tasty cause. We've had bees in the building since 2013, and, and over the years we've really grown that. You know, starting with two hives, we're producing really a, a large number of um, honey, about six, seven hundred pounds um, this in 2019, and, and we see that growing every year. The talented executive chef Thomas McEwen is actually allergic to the sting, so he leaves tending the rooftop hives to pastry chef James Gallo who has become quite the beekeeper. We've now grown to six beehives with, at the peak of the season, we'll house over a million bees, 250 feet above Peachtree Street in downtown Atlanta. 
What's so neat is you get up here and you realize how green the city is, which also means there's a lot of different flowers. There are some sources for these bees all around downtown Atlanta. We were able to surmise from, from some of our honeys and their flavor profiles, the Carter Center, the King Center, of course, the Atlanta Botanical Gardens, Georgia Tech. There's a lot of green, and that means a lot of pollen and a lot of nectar for the bees to collect. So Georgia Tech not only has yellow jackets, they have honeybees. They have a lot of honeybees, actually. Last week, I pulled all the honey off of them. Okay. So, but it would be cool to see what they've done in a in week. A week, yeah. You know, being 250 feet up, yeah. it's the winds are higher, it's hotter up here, everything. And you are estimating a million bees live up here in these the hives. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. The average life of a worker bee is about 10 weeks. In that 10 weeks, they will produce estimated between an eighth and a half of a teaspoon of honey. This just came back on last week. So I want to see what they've done in, the, in one week. They're working. So we have... Look at that. This is all nectar here and down in here. Oh, you can see the honey starting in there. Yep. Yeah. Um, so if we were to do something so silly what, like yeah. this. Oh, that would just... Um, <laughs> see a finger going in here? Oh, yeah. I got a hole. Oh. Okay. And look, are, are they drinking the honey? Yep. Or are they, now they're, they're eating it. What yep. the heck happened to our home? Yeah. Okay. But they will now, within two days, that'll be fixed they'll have that right back to where it was supposed to be. So here we have, they've actually already started capping over here. Mm -hmm. That so, means, hey, we're done with this hole, yep. we're gonna cap it. So now once it's officially ca or capped, it's officially honey. Okay. Technically before that, it's nectar. So uh, I, was, I just had a taste of nectar. Yeah. This is such an iconic spot. The blue disc, Polaris, is an iconic landmark in Georgia. And I bet over 99% of people don't realize there are bees, there are a million bees that called this their home. Yeah, I'll go up to Polaris at night and hang out up there and I'll talk to guests and sometimes they don't even realize they're here until you say something. And then they're fascinated by it and now they want the honey. And so. they order something with honey. Yes. That, that Talk about local. Yes. <laughs> and this may have been my favorite part. Chef Gallo stood in this one spot for a while and the bees clogged up behind him, waiting patiently at his back almost like they were at a traffic light. And as soon as he moved out of their way... And here they come. There they go. Oh, that's cool. They buzzed right on back to work. The chefs of Polaris are working on bringing this full rooftop garden back to its original glory. The pandemic to blame as usual. But the bees made it through, and the queen kept her rooftop colony in order. And this amazing Polaris blue honey is the result. A variety offered in many different sizes at the lobby downstairs, but the best thing to do with this honey is to get it in the hands of Chef Thomas and let him do his magic. We have Polaris here, of course, at the top of the hotel, looking over the whole city. You can see as far as Stone Mountain, Kennesaw Mountain. And this is our upscale dining option that has unique flavors and great products, as well as great cocktails. Well, you are obviously a huge fan of local. You're supporting farmers, you're supporting Georgia retailers, but also there's a taste reason why you do it. You're gonna put out good food. In Georgia, we're very lucky to have the best ingredients available to us all year round. We support about 76 vendors in the state that we utilize their products on a daily basis. South Georgia, you can get some really good honey. Downtown Atlanta, you can get some really good honey. The flavor, as you can tell, is really fantastic. Depending on what type of the year, the different colors of honey, it really has a different flavor. And it was fun. James was talking about they're almost like a beer lineup. You got your stout, you got your IPA down there, your, your amber, your hazy. It's, it's really neat. They don't taste like beer, a little bit sweeter. And for us to be able to get our hands on local products and how much more local than a few hundred feet from the restaurant and to be able to utilize that in our menus, it makes a big difference. Okay, well this is absolute torture sitting right here, seeing all this food and not eating yet. I, there's, there's bacon hovering over here, there's honey over here. Where do we get started, Chef? Yeah, so we're gonna showcase a local charcuterie board where all the items are from Georgia. So we'll start off with some Pine Street Market spec. Uh, this comes from Avondale and 
being so high up in the city, it's cool that we're able to put these on a plate and nearly point out the parts of the city where the food's coming yeah, from. Yeah, there's Avondale. Yeah, you're like right over here, <laughs> yeah. if you go east to here. And this is speck. Tell this the difference between speck and prosciutto. So or... this is an aged ham. This comes from a good friend of mine named Rusty Barris. He owns Pine Street Market. I've been working with Rusty close to 10 years. As you can see, my Georgia accent's gotten very strong over yeah, the years. Yeah, yeah, you, you and, pulled uh, it off. Yeah, doing pretty good. This is Green Hill. And this comes from Sweetgrass Dairy down in Thomasville, Georgia. Absolutely. So it's a really wonderful cheese. We're going to cut a little section off here. So you can see how it's a really beautiful brie. Great texture. Oh, it's just creamy. Yeah, and they make great cheeses. This is just one of their amazing cheeses. And then a good friend of mine, Mary Rigdon, who owns Decimal Place Farms. This is her feta cheese. And if this you is a goat feta. Yeah, and if okay. you haven't had it, I it's really it. amazing. Okay, goat feta. Yeah. And that's Mary Rigdon, it's the name of the farmer. That is phenomenal. It's different from feta I'm used to. Yeah, it has a great flavor uh, and it really is super fresh. So, of course, we're going to take some more. You need to always have a hard cheese when you're doing a meat and cheese display. Okay. Thomasville Tom, named after uh, Thomasville, of course, Sweetgrass Dairy Grain. It almost looks like a, a Parmesan. Yeah, it does. It's called a Tom. Okay. And it has a, there's another taste for you. I like has these tastes. These are good sample size, right? A nice little nuttiness to this cheese. And um, it has a nice hardness on the outside, but then goes soft on the inside. Mmm, yeah. That's got a little more bite right at the top, but not too much. Yeah. And then when you're doing the charcuterie, I love to have some pickles in here. Good friend of ours, again, Do South Pickles. The owner actually came from New Orleans originally. So he likes to put a little kick into it. Oh, right, the kick comes a little later. Oh, I love that. It's a sweet. Yeah, and it's really, really great. And you oh, can see this time. adds a really nice color to it. Mm -hmm. And of course, this wouldn't be done without some of our own honeycomb. We're going to cut out a section. So right here, straight from the rooftop. Oh, this is I look at this that. contraption. Oh, my goodness. Beautiful honeycomb right from the hive. We'll put it right here. And that's going to go with... It goes really well with great. It's great with the cheeses. Okay. It's great with the meats. Now, when people are eating honeycomb, can you eat the comb? Everybody knows yeah. about the honey. So honey's honeycomb. been available for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. You can go back to the Egyptians, and they were eating honey. And they say that this was, the honeycomb was the original chewing gum. So it's kind of like this gumminess to it, so you can chew on it and um, really get all the flavor out of it. So it's really a great item to have. Got it, got it. And I think it's missing one item. What do you think? Does it not have bacon? Yeah, let's do it. We, okay, we here, have I can it. help you with Thank that. You. Yeah, there you go. So I've taken, know. again, Pine Street Market. I've taken our honey, and I've glazed it and finished it in the oven. So it gets this really nice shininess to it. It's like candy. It's just like candied bacon. Oh, my god. So goodness. I think we'll just add just one little The piece slip. broke off. What do you that do? You can... We'll just have to snack on that okay. one. And there you have a nice little simple charcuterie plate. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That is unreal. And you have that floralness oh. from the honey and then the crisp bacon. Oh, that is amazing. Just to be able to showcase every item from our beautiful state and the great products that we can get. So as I enjoyed the Chef Thomas Spectacular, Chef James went to the freezer to grab the Polaris Special. You see the cute little dome and hard chocolate disc? And yes, inside, more goodness awaits. This is exciting. This is James' work. What we have is actually this blue dome which represents the building, the Polaris Dome. But on the inside, inside this blue capsule is our honey caramel on the inside. So as you crack in through the chocolate mousse, you have this beautiful honey caramel on the inside. We just place this down, we grab our blue dome, and without breaking the chocolate, we place it right here. Oh, you have this so beautiful cool. look. We're going to take our gluten-free crumble and we finish it off with more chocolate. Oh my gosh. Chocolate sorbet. So there you have our signature blue dome dessert. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Where do I start? I mean, do I go to the ice cream? I would go right into the chocolate mousse. Okay, I can find that honey ball. There you have it. It's flowing out. Oh, oh what a good mix. Yeah, he, he done a spectacular job, and as I said, what a great way to finish your meal up here in Polaris. Oh, I love that dose of honey there. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, James. <laughs> oh, how the honey flows from the rooftops of downtown Atlanta through the gorgeous southern Appalachians and the wildflower swamps and rich farmland of deep south Georgia. These worker bees, mostly the girls, but also a few helpful boys, 
deliver a rich, nutritious, and timeless product. I'm David Zelski. See you at the next Fork in the Road. <laughs>